we're not live yet. I should have poured wine. What is wrong with me? That's okay. <laughs> We are going to have a good time. Hey, everyone. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Mark Sievers. Saturday night. You're joining me again. So I'm just going to, we'll make a little bit of small talk while we wait for others to log on and to get up to speed. But I'm so happy that you're joining me for another Together Live on a Saturday night. This is going to be a lot of fun. So few questions right off the bat. Do you guys like the Saturday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time time slot? Um, available would be one hour earlier, so a 6 p.m. Eastern time time slot. Or even during the week, maybe, or on the weekend, Saturday mid-morning. So let me know because I want to try to give everybody a chance to make sure that they have the time and the focus to join in with me on these live, together live virtual cooking classes and master classes. So let me know in the comments. Ryan is mic'd. Say hello, Ryan. Hello, everybody. So Ryan is mic'd again tonight because you guys really loved that. And I think it makes for a little bit more conversation. And then can we show them the new angle we have tonight too? Yes. This is going to be great. Here you go. Et voila. So how wonderful is this? So I think for me, this feels so much more intimate, so much more, I think, just really inviting. And I hope you're getting that vibe because I love the sweeping view of the counter and it's going to give me some great options to show you guys some things close up and just give me a little bit more workspace. So. Tonight, we are going to make together my pastry dough from scratch using zero electric equipment. No specialty kitchen tools, no specialty kitchenware, no fancy gadgets. This is like back to basics, basics, back to basics. And I'm going to show you one of my techniques that I learned uh, really almost 20, maybe even 25 years ago, watching an old episode of Julia Child make French savory tarts. And she was using the French technique called frisage, F-R-A-I-S-A-G-E, which is a very classic technique of using the heel of your hand to work in the butter into the dough. So we're going to kind of get started. And if you're cooking along, or if you're going to, not even really cooking, if you're making dough along with me, just do exactly what I'm doing. But this is really meant for if you're not, sit back and relax. But when I wrote my recipe about, I don't know, eight years ago, I think, for my French savory tart, to explain the process of how to work in the butter into the flour, in directions was a challenge for me because I thought it's really just something that if you watch it once or twice it will just register you'll remember how to do it every single time going forward and sometimes it's easier to learn techniques just by watching rather than reading and I hope that's what I can show you this evening so this dough by the way is going to be a savory dough tonight and as we're putting in ingredients, you'll see how you can substitute, for instance, white pepper and rosemary, maybe for a little bit more cinnamon and some sugar. And you can take it to the sweet side too. I use this dough for French tarts, which of course I showed you before, these beautiful tart pans. Ryan, give them a little close up over here. I love this. So this is just a classic French pan with a removable bait bottom. And I use it for tarts like this, and I also use it for crostatas, which are my, like, I would say it's like the lazy man's pie. And 
<laughs> right? It's so, they're so much easier. I, I was think... gonna say that I love them, and then you called it a lazy man's pie. Oh, sorry. Well, That's... I mean, the, I mean, you know, not having to fill pie shells and lattice crusts <laughs> and all these things. Cristada is a really beautiful thing. So I'm going to show you how to get the base for that started as well. So let's kind of get started with the dough itself. So I just have a gr nice bowl here and I'm going to add to that one and a half cups of flour. And we've measured flour many times together. You just lighten it with your cup. And today I'm going to show you another way of taking the back of your knife and just tapping it down and sweeping it across. And et voila, a perfectly leveled cup of flour. So we need one and a half cups. Plus we'll need a little bit more for our countertop to kind of roll out this dough later. But So don't put your flour away just yet. So one and a half cups right in. Put that to the side. Now we're going to add all of the good stuff. So we're going to add some sea salt. This is just one teaspoon of sea salt. And I'm going to add two teaspoons of sugar. And you're thinking sugar in a savory dough. Well, sugar not only kind of adds just a tiny bit of sweetness to kind of just to give it some more flavor, but it also kind of tenderizes the dough. And I think it just gives it a much more well-rounded flavor than if you didn't add it. So just like you put sometimes salt into sweet things, we're just reversing it. We're putting sweet things into savory things. So, and then some beautiful minced fresh rosemary. So you see, this is perfectly minced, pretty finely minced because rosemary, the leaves are kind of tough. And I'm using a whole tablespoon of minced rosemary. And you don't want to bite into a rosemary leaf because they're not as tender, you know, like a beautiful basil or uh, a sage or a thyme. Rosemary is a little bit more woody. And the reason I have all of these herbs over here is that if, for instance, you wanted to, say you wanted to make the filling of a French tart and you wanted to have maybe some rosemary in the filling, then you could put some basil in the crust. You could put some thyme in the crust. You could even put some fresh Italian leaf parsley in the crust. And it's just, a, so that's the first substitution right there. So once you just get the one and a half cups of flour, one teaspoon of salt, two teaspoons of sugar, and then one teaspoon of herbs. I'm using straight rosemary, but all of these other herbs are perfectly well to use. Yes. Uh oh, sorry, everybody. Let me move this. I, was I was giving you such a gorgeous. How's that? Better? Oh, <laughs> sorry, everybody. So now we're going to add in some pepper. And usually I use black pepper across the board, freshly ground black pepper. But I also, in my cabinet, have white pepper and then pink peppercorns. So white pepper, I, I think is a little bit milder in flavor to me, and it's a little bit less spicy, which in the crust, it just gives it this lovely, slight peppery, beautiful, mm, and when it's ground, it smells amazing. It just gives it a little bit of a lighter peppery flavor. And if you don't have white pepper, you can certainly use black pepper, it's not a problem. Um, I also love white pepper in crostadas with apples. It's so delicious. So if you put, if you maybe leave out the rosemary and just put in some white pepper and a little bit of cinnamon into, this, into the dough, and then you fill it with freshly sliced apples, oh, white pepper and apples are delicious. And then that's just about a half a teaspoon. So I'm just gonna mix this up a little bit. And now we need to put in our fat. So we need to go to the kitchen and get our butter, which is nice and cold, and some water, which is also nice and cold. So some crusts use a combination of, whoops, butter and vegetable shortening. I never have vegetable shortening in the fridge. And it's just another thing I have to worry about getting at the grocery store. So I just use all butter, uh, unsalted, 
this is very cold, ice cold butter. And this is a uh, European style butter. Um, you can use Irish butter, French butter, European style butter, or just regular unsalted butter, whatever you can find. So I'm just gonna give this a nice dice. And the quickest way is to just cut it right down the center, rotate it, and then dice this up. This is kind of the same process we did when we made fig and cream scones a while back, or yeah, two weeks ago, I think, where we just put in cold butter, we used cold cream, and cold butter in this is, is what's gonna give that crust beautiful flavor. And there's just no substitution for really good butter. So, now we're going back to our pastry blender. So I have, this is a really nice, heavy stainless steel pastry blender. I know sometimes when we're at like flea markets or antique shops and we see the old thin wire pastry blenders with the wooden handle and they're so charming and I get it. They're very, very pretty. But this is like a, this is like the workhorse pastry blender. Nice and heavy, good grip of a handle. It's completely unbranded. I think I got it at a, pa at a restaurant supply store. But if you don't have a pastry blender, really get a good heavy one because this really is your best friend in the kitchen when it comes to making pie doughs and pastry doughs. And you'll even need one f when we make my white bean sliders next week. So look for one, let's look online. So all I'm doing now is just, just like pr using my pressure and just cutting the butter into the flour. I mean, it smells so good. You can smell the rosemary and the white pepper. Ryan and I love any, we really love peppery things in this house. So when I make this for the two of us, sometimes I'll add black pepper and pink pepper and white pepper, but. It has a depth of flavor that I feel like when you bake with it, it infuses in the crust and mm -hmm. makes it a richer, it's, it's not just a heat yeah. and it's not just a flavor. It's a beautiful combo of both. Well, and it's never overly peppery. It just has a well-roundedness, like you said. Hmm. He's, he does listen to me when I talk. <laughs> well, I just like Hey, did that leave it at a nice comment? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're just gonna work that butter into the into the flour, and I'll give you a nice little close up here. So you can see it's just broken up, just a little bit, and there's still these big chunks. So if you did this in the food processor, you would they would come out kind of like the size of peas or like a coarse grain sand, but this still has some fairly large chunks of butter in it, and that is where that technique is gonna come into handy. So now I have some very ice cold water. I have about three quarters of a cup and I'm gonna add in half a cup right in. Perfect. And then using just your, I just use my little, my four little fingers here, make a little scoop and I just scoop it around just like this. And you'll see as you, as you, as you mix and you keep going, you'll, you'll, Feel the dough come together. The water will get absorbed into the flour. And you're trying to use the least part of your hands as possible because you don't want to get that dough warm. We want that, we don't want that butter to get warm and kind of get mushy. We want it to stay nice and cold. So, okay, so this, here we go. So a little bit more flour on my countertop. I'm gonna make such a mess tonight, but that's okay. And I'm just gonna dump this out. Make sure you get all the butter and the flour from the bowl. And now, so you're just gonna kinda gather it into a ball and you can see it at home, and maybe we can give them a nice close-up here, Ryan. But you can see, is that a good angle there? Oh, yeah. 
so you can see the big chunks of butter. And we're not really going to lose that with this technique of frisage. It's just going to help it blend in a little bit better. So, perfect. So I'm going to take the heel of my hand right here. This is the coolest part of, of your hand. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do it from an angle for you. So what I want to do is I want to use the heel of my hand and push little bits of dough out from the, the larger ball of dough onto the countertop. And that's going to kind of help to press and, and distribute that butter a little bit better. And you don't really have to do it more than once. So, and you're not taking big chunks, see if you can see from the side, you're not taking a big chunk. You're taking small amounts and you're just pushing it like this. And what that is doing is just helping to flatten out that butter. Do it again. And again, the butter is not gonna completely dissipate but it's just gonna work it into the dough a little bit better. There. And it smells good when you do it. So, you can see here, the countertop has got a little bit of butter and dough residue and that's exactly what we're looking for. And you'll see that the dough now really feels nice and smooth. You can, you can, when you do this at home, you'll hear the difference to, of the, when you're doing the technique, you'll hear the butter almost kind of soften up and get well incorporated into that dough. And then a little bit more flour so it doesn't stick. Okay, so that's it. So. We're going to wrap this in some plastic wrap and chill it for one hour or overnight and then you'll be ready to use it. So I have one already done so let's go get that and let me show you exactly what I'm going to do with this dough and how to how to make it into some beautiful things. Actually let me do this. Let me take so this is the nice cold dough. Wrap it in plastic. I think making dough, people get scared. And I think there's so many techniques and don't add all the water and don't do this and make it in a food processor and, or make it in a blender or make it in a mixer. Or, oh, it's, it, it, I can see why people would be intimidated. I've been using this technique myself for, I mean, years and years and years, and it's never failed me. And my measurements for this dough have stayed the same now for, I think, almost about 10 years. So it's never failed. So I hope that you give that a try at home. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the crostata first. So the a crostata, and I have a beautiful recipe. Let me show you a photo of this. I have a beautiful recipe. All of my cookbooks are covered in flour and butter and everything smells delicious. And my cookbook table for uh, entertaining with love for a tomato and goat cheese crostata. And it's this beautiful like open face pie almost, I would say is the, the easiest way to understand what it is. And it's such a, it's such a beautiful thing to make, especially with all of the farmers markets and farm stands coming up. It's really a, a wonderful recipe to make. I should have just used my recipe index, but instead I'm doing it the hard way. <laughs> We're getting there, guys. I promise. Here it is. So let's see. How's that for a photo Ryan yeah come this way a little bit there you go so look at that so this is a crostata you'll see the pastry edges filled with tomatoes and goat cheese and a big gorgeous garnish of basil so you can take technically take that exact same concept and fill it with roasted you could roast carrots you could do a sweet version with apples on my website, there's also a recipe for 
a autumnal, autumnal fruit um, or a fall fruit crostata. It's delicious with ice cream or with a salad. So it's a really versatile thing. So a crust and, and you don't need any special pans or anything. You just need a pastry, um, a half, half sheet pan and a piece of parchment paper. So I have all my rolling pins out here because I wanted to show you some rolling pins too. So this was my Nan's rolling pin. Um, it's the, the traditional style with the handles and it's, it still smells like her baking drawer, which is like buttery and just delicious and it's so smooth. And I don't really use it because I actually don't love that it has these hard edges, but I keep it for good memories. But I do have two other ones that I think are really, really great. So this is like a French style rolling pin. It's a beautiful piece of wood with tapered handles and it's, it feels really nice to roll something out. And because it doesn't have that hard edge, your, your pastry won't get any lines in it or your cookie dough or whatever you're rolling out. And then this one, and I, I brought this back from Paris, but you can find them now in every major um, cookware shop online. And I don't know where I bought this one, but it's kind of like a French rolling pin that just doesn't have any tapers and it's really, really heavy. So let's do this big one I think will be good for today. So I have a little bit of flour on my board here. A little flour on the dough and a little flour on the rolling pin. And to make a crostata, it's really, you just wanna roll this out to I would say and flip it and when you roll the dough you can hear the butter and because there's so much butter in this dough you want to make sure you keep it moving on your board and you want to make sure that you keep everything floured so it doesn't stick and I like to just keep turning it mm. so the idea here is you want to roll this out to about between a quarter and an eighth of an inch. While you're doing that, you have a question about your thoughts on marble rolling pins. Ooh, you know, I've, excuse me, I've never used a marble rolling pin before. Um, I would imagine that because marble, I'm working on a marble surface to keep the butter nice and cold, that a marble rolling pin would probably keep your dough nice and cold and your butter nice and cold. So, I don't know, Ryan, why don't you order me? <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say, we've seen, so we've seen hollow rolling pins that you fill with ice water. I've seen that. Why don't you, you know what, I'm gonna order, I'll order a metal, a um, marble rolling pin and let you know. Unless you have one, let me know. But what I love about crostatas too is that the dough doesn't have to be a perfect circle. I hate things that have to be so perfect. So, but look at the gorgeous. Can you guys see over here all the butter? Look at these big, beautiful, gorgeous things of butter. So if I was making a crostata, I would take this, roll it up onto my pin here, take this, put it right down in the center, just like this, do all of my filling right here, and then all you have to do is just fold down the sides just like this. Of course, the filling will dictate how much you roll it over, just like that. And give it an egg wash and bake it. And then you get the most beautiful sweet or savory crostata. But I'm going to show you something a little bit more... The next thing I'm going to show you, I should say, is a little bit more technical driven. And it's lining a, sh a uh, tart pan and then the steps of blind baking, which again, scares the be I am almost sore. Scares <laughs> people to death. <laughs> so when we're doing um, any size tart pan, whether it's a square or a rectangle or a round, 
you have to do a couple things. We have to get some butter, so stay right there. Let me grab a little bit of butter. And even though there's butter in the tart, I always butter my tart pan. And no fancy equipment here, just my fingers. And making sure that the butter gets into those fluted areas and mm, just like that. So take your dough again, roll it around your pen and just unroll it and whoops, unfurl, unfurl it in. So the thing you don't want to do with pastry dough is stretch it or stretch it in or stretch it to be bigger. If you stretch it, it will retract when you bake it and then it will shrink. So the nice little edge around here. So now you just want to lift up the edges and let it fall, let the weight, let gravity of the dough do its own thing and let it fall into the fluted edges. And you'll see, I don't, so this is, this is when I was saying it's sometimes easier for me to talk through it or show you and for you to watch than it is to read. So when I'm, I'll try to do it from this way so you can see. So I'm not just taking the dough and doing that and, and letting it go. Taking the dough and I'm finding the bottom and then I'm pushing, I'm not doubling the thickness, but I'm, I'm taking a little bit of dough and I'm kind of fortifying those edges a little bit. I hope you can see that on camera. It's just- We can see it well. So you're kind of not pushing, but sort of like- It's like folding over a tiny little yeah. bit. And what that's going to do is help to fortify the edges of this dough and of this tart. And, you know, some people, especially too, some people I think get scared and go, oh, but if you don't use any vegetable shortening or, uh, you know, or my pastry shell shrank a little bit, it's okay. I, I, I don't understand why all of a sudden everything that you're making at home has to look like it's coming out of a... I don't know, a, a commercial kitchen. <laughs> I like when things look homemade. And I think it also leaves for a little bit of leeway, <laughs> which I am a fan of. So again, I'm just going down and just pushing into place, making a little bit of that dough along those that wall a little bit thicker. Just push, 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 whoops. And that's gonna help, again, make those sides of your tart nice and thick and crisp and hold in all of that filling. Okay, so that's the first step, right? You can take your knife and you can run it along here and cut all this off and I, I think that's a nuisance. I just take my rolling pin and roll it right across the top here. And you'll see when you roll it across the top, that helps get all of the scraps out. But it will also show you, you'll, and you wanna save these scraps because when you bake this at home, if there's any tears or if maybe some of the crust sinks down a little too much, you can use these scraps and build it back up again. That's really important. Then I'm just taking, so now we've, We've, whoops. So now that we've kind of fortified those sides a little bit, now I'm just gonna take my thumbs and really just push it up a tiny little bit. And what that's gonna do is kind of compensate for any of that shrinking. So you're kind of just softly applying pressure. Very soft pressure. And again, my friends, make that own a bakery here called Hendrix Belgian Bread Center in Chicago. They make the most beautiful quiches. They're golden brown and they're, they're not 
they're not perfect. So I know that they made them from scratch. I know they made them in, in the, the pastry kitchen. And I love that it has a little bit of a, regular, a regularity to them. So, just you, like that. You have a question on flour. Flour. Christine Sutherland. Hi, Christine. Uh, she has a friend who is gluten. Are you still not cooking? Because <laughs> you're all packing? She, she has a friend who is gluten intolerant. Can she substitute almond flour in this recipe? So, I have to be honest with you, Christine. I am not an expert in swapping out all-purpose flour for other types of flours. What I would suggest doing... Um, there is a flour called, it's a Thomas Keller product called Cup for Cup. And that I have had success with swapping out literally a cup of all-purpose flour for a cup of his Cup for Cup flour. Um, I never try any substitutions like that the first time if I'm going to serve it. So try locating that flour or try it with your almond flour. I don't I, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you, so I would not want to steer you wrong. But if you can get your hands on cup for cup, that seems to really be the best flour across uh, the, 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 the gluten-free brands that I have come into contact with. So I'm sorry that I gave you an answer, non-answer. <laughs> but I think you gave some really good advice in there, which is don't, for the, if you're going to serve it, don't experiment when you're serving it. Mm -mm. Practice, mm -mm. give it a try. Nope. Ryan is the only person, Ryan and a few select friends are the only people that ever try anything for the very first time. Ryan always loves everything. Other friends are a little bit more honest. Not that one time. <laughs> oh yeah, that one time was pretty gross. <laughs> so, all right, let's get back to this idea of blind baking. So, if you just put this into the oven and what would happen is all of this would puff up and you'd have a big giant mess. So, and if you also just put it into the oven with your custard filling into it, that also would have a soggy bottom. Nobody wants a soggy bottom. So I'm just taking the regular, regular dinner fork and just the tines, and all I'm gonna do is prick it all over. And I don't mean just like every few inches once. I mean, I'm going around in a complete circle and following the shell, getting as close to the edge as possible. And then doing another circle so that you're really, this is gonna help prevent the crust from, or the dough I should say, from puffing up. And again, it's these little tiny steps that if you if you don't do them, you'll you'll you won't end up with the best quality of tart. So it's good to remember these few steps because it really does elevate home baking but it still keeps it earthy and, 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 and approachable. And I think that's really important. So, that is almost ready. So now what I'm gonna do is take a piece of parchment paper. And I'm gonna, I don't butter it, I don't do anything. I just lay it inside of the pastry crust. And then I'm gonna fill it with some dried beans. I've been using these beans for this purpose for I think we're going on eight years for this jar of beans. And this is called blind baking. And what, the, what these beans are doing is they're weighing down your pie crust. There's all kinds of different Things you can use to, you can use rice, you can, they even make fancy ceramic pie weights. Um, I don't know, I think a good old bag of red kidney beans in a jar afterwards work just fine. So what you want to do is when you're blind baking, and this is going to help, again, this is going to help the sides from collapsing as it bakes, because we don't want that. And this is a step you absolutely cannot uh, skip. You shouldn't skip any of these steps. This one in particular, you really have just a buttery mess in the, in the oven. So from here, 
I would then just transfer this to my parchment, to my uh, sheet pan, just like this. And then I would bake this. All of my instructions for the French savory tart are listed at marksievers.com. Um, I think I would bake this for, I think it's like 10 or 15 minutes. And then I would take out the parchment paper, just like this. Let those beans cool completely before you put them back into a container or the, you'll have kind of a stinky mess and that's not good. Prick the bottom again after you after the first bake. Prick it again, prick it again, because that will, you'll notice a few little pockets when you take it out the first time. You'll go, oh, that rose a little bit. Prick, 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 all the way around again. And then you're gonna put it back into the oven, just the shell, no, no, no beans, no weights, no nothing. Put it back into the oven. It's gonna get nice and crisp and golden. That's when you'll also see the very first time you take it out, you'll see, oh, maybe I need to do a little patchwork, take a little bit of dough, patch it up. Um, you know, oh, maybe it, maybe one side, a little corner kind of, uh, you know, shrank a little bit too much. Fortify it, patch it up, bake it again. And then after that, you're gonna add your fillings, your custards, your anything you think is delicious into your blind baked shell. Bake it off to finish, and then when you take it out, you'll have the most perfectly crisp, buttery pastry shell there is. So now you see, I think watching it and hearing the instructions versus reading them and trying to imagine, I think it's a little bit more self-explanatory. And I actually like doing things like this. I like to talk about things like this because, again, pastry dough really freaks people out. And once you master this beautiful tart shell, you'll really be able to use it in so many applications. You know, this is great with a beautiful egg custard. You can make a, you can make a sweet version of this. I, I tend to not like big, thick, mile-high quiche and things like that. I like things that are very thin, very velvety, very creamy. Um, so I hope that you guys got some inspiration for this. With Memorial Day weekend coming up, you could do a beautiful version of this and you could bake it with gorgeous... Um, maybe some, some new spring vegetables, some fingerling potatoes, some carrots, some leeks, and a gorgeous egg custard. The egg custard mixture that's on marksievers.com under this recipe for the French savory tart, use that mixture. It, it fits perfectly into an 11 and a half inch tart pan. Use that custard mixture and then tweak all of the fillings, onions and vegetables. And I made one for Easter. Uh, actually, the photo that I used to promote tonight's class of those two smaller quiches, those small, smaller tarts, that was actually Easter day. Um, I made one for Ryan and I, and then our really good friend Pam lives a couple blocks away. And I dropped one off with her doorman and as a little Easter treat. So you can, this, this dough made two smaller ones. So again, it's all about mastering pastry dough and doing it by hand means you can also impress people. If you're going to stay someplace at the, on the, for the weekend, if you're going to go stay with some friends on the weekend, you can use the same technique, impress them with the frisage technique with the palm of your hand, and then make a beautiful fruit crostata for dessert and everybody will be wild. So. I hope you guys had fun. Questions? You guys are quiet tonight. It is a quiet night, I think everybody's... Uh... Is everybody watching? I think it is a quiet night. I think we've got a lot of folks watching. Hi, so everybody. Folks are just enjoying. So, well, I'm happy. That means you guys are like, I hope this gives you the courage to, to go forth and try this. Um, at the beginning of the video, I did say, if you guys like this 7 p.m. time, 7 p.m. Eastern time time slot, um, let me know in the comments if you think maybe an hour earlier would be better. Let me know. Or maybe if you think like Saturday mornings would be good. You know, I know a lot of us are, are trying to get into routines. And I know a lot of you have children. So 
I'm trying to think of times where maybe kids after dinner, maybe they're with their their other parent, or um, I want you to be able to have time to to watch and do. So let me know if you guys have some other time suggestions. Um, I'm typically not that entertaining at like eight in the morning, so no. I will not enter even think we, about that. We but... won't be doing that time. <laughs> yeah, Ryan is also, you know, we, we need the other Mr. Seavers yeah. to make all of this happen. So we need to keep that, that Mr. Seavers. I could do it. I just don't want to have to wrangle you. <laughs> You in have the business, a lot of support. There is a, there, in, the, in, the, in the fashion and style business, there is a person called a child wrangler. Um, that is an actual human being whose job it is to wrangle children on set and keep them occupied and all of that stuff. So uh, is, did you just compare yourself no. to a child wrangler no. because of me? No, I love you so much. Okay. Um, you have a lot that of is, support that for is your the current right time slot. <laughs> Okay, I like this time slot. It gives me a great Saturday to do whatever I want to do, and then we get to be together. So um, I hope you enjoyed tonight. I hope it inspired you. Um, head over to MarkSievers.com for the full written recipe. Search French Savory Tart. Um, it's broken down into the dough and the custard and how to bake it and all of those things. Um, and... Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. Like this video, give it a thumbs up because, you know, we're super cool. And uh, yeah, hit the little notification bell so you're notified of new videos as soon as they post. And I think when they hit the notification bell, they're also aware of the premiere function as well for videos. Correct. So that's really great. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I never really do, like, PSAs, but YouTube for me is, I really love connecting with you this way, and I, I think you're enjoying it, too. So, thank you again for spending part of your Saturday evening, your precious weekend with me, and I really appreciate it. So, I have to go put this dough into the fridge. I'm going to blind bake that, and I think a tart for tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Liz Grant was cooking along, and oh, she hi. said that hers came out beautifully. So Liz, did you actually like bake it and everything, or did you just get it to a certain stage? I would love to know that. I think there's a little bit of a delay. There is so. a delay, but she said it came out beautiful and so delicious. Oh, so you must have baked it. Great. Did you, and, you know, let other people in the comments, I, you know, I think if you see comments from other people that you want to respond to, please do make this a community, make this a kind of a sounding board for, for all of you, because I would love to know, you know, I, I do go back and I read everything and I think it's really fun, the things that you guys are saying and, and the support. So thank you. Liz used Vidalia onions. Oh, so good job, Liz. Do you deliver? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's it, you guys. Saturday night. I think it's time to blind bake this shell, open a little bubbly. It's always time for bubbly. And uh, I will see you guys next Saturday night. Head over to MarkSeavers.com to get all that information. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Au revoir. I'll be there.